was talking about Mafiosa, uh, what way to secure error threaded computation functions. Thanks, Ali. And thanks for inviting me here. Uh, I'm going to talk about some recent work uh, on lightweight secure arithmetic computation. Since we have an implementation, we had to name it, so we called it Leviosa. Um, this is joint work with uh, Karmit Yuval and uh, uh, Antonio. So we've seen a lot of uh, talks uh, in the past uh, two days on secure uh, computation. We know this is feasible since the 80s, but what about efficiency? This is one of the aspects we are talking about uh, in this workshop. Uh, just so that uh, I put this work in context, I want to say this talk is going to be about um, constant number of parties. For the most part, it's going to be two parties. I'll tell a little bit about multi-parties uh, at the end. Um, we're going to focus on functions expressed uh, as an arithmetic circuit as opposed to uh, a Boolean circuit. So, you know, we're not talking about any garbling techniques in this paper, but um, functionalities that are expressed as an arithmetic circuit over um, some finite field. And one can also express integer computation in this space, but you know this is sort of the kind of tasks that we are looking for. And um, we want full security, meaning security against malicious parties up to n minus one uh, corruption. Just one slide about uh, motivation. A lot of things that we care about can be expressed as uh, an arithmetic uh, circuit. Uh, a lot of threshold cryptography, which is relevant to uh, the blockchain space, can be expressed as um, an arithmetic circuit. Neural network computations can be expressed. Uh, uh, they are basically matrix multiplications over some integer space and uh, can be expressed as an arithmetic circuit. Pattern matching, statistics, etc. all of these fall under this category. And I was speaking with uh, Mike and Abhi yesterday, who was also saying set intersection, which is sort of part of pattern matching, also can be expressed as uh, an arithmetic uh, functionality. So in general, I mean, we are all familiar with this blueprint, at least in crypto. If you want to generate, if you want to construct a secure computation protocol, you start with something that is secure against a benign adversary that we call a passive adversary. And then we boost the security against uh, malicious parties. Now, what is this talk about? This talk is primarily about understanding what does it take to do the step two? What is the overhead of getting active security from uh, a passive secure uh, protocol? OK? Um, just uh, before we get into the main results, I want to say sort of in this space, the main building blocks that people have considered when you talk about secure computation is of course oblivious transfer. This is extensively used in Boolean computations. Um, it's complete for um, uh, secure computation. We know what this functionality is. There are many, many efficient implementations. We just saw the previous talk, which, is, which supposedly is going to do something better than what we know with OT extensions. And you know, this has also led to like all the recent improvements in uh, fast Boolean secure computation. I want to talk about a slight extension of uh, oblivious transfer, which will also be relevant in this work, which is sort of K out of N OT, where the receiver can get uh, an arbitrary K subset from uh, N entries uh, of the sender. A second primitive that's used here, more relevant to the arithmetic space, is the oblivious linear evaluation. Again, you've all defined this. I'm not going to get into what this, uh, you know, what this functionality is about. But this is a second building block that's used in um, and more focused on secure arithmetic uh, uh, computations. So, what do we know in this space? Um, I'm talking again. Uh, it's sort of a biased presentation, but I sort of want to list some generic techniques in the space of getting secure arithmetic computation. If you wanted two-party computation, say in the OLE hybrid, meaning assuming that there is uh, you're using some OLE protocol uh, in a black box fashion, uh, there's been a series of works, and I'm talking about the ones that. Um, you're going to look at more things that were concretely efficient, and uh, the work of Dotling et al. from CCS 2017 shows that you can get this, where you can get a secure two-party arithmetic computation, where for every multiplication gate in your circuit, you have to invoke a malicious OLE protocol 22 times. 
And of course, there are works that you know cast an arithmetic function, like you can implement OLE in the OT hybrid and then use it in the arithmetic functionality. In this case, again, starting from the work of Gilboa in 99, now they, you can show that you can construct a malicious protocol here where, again, every multiplication gate is going to invoke the OT uh, functionality six log F times, where log F is sort of the size of the field elements. And then there has been more recent work which uses like tailor-made oblivious linear OLE implementations based on like um, LWE-based OLE implementations here to get malicious security. Why I say tailor-made is like you, you uh, fine-tune zero-knowledge proofs to get uh, malicious uh, security. So this is sort of, in general, the state of affairs. I should say that, again, uh, I made these slides like three months back. There's been more work in sort of improving this, uh, at least in this uh, last category where you have more efficient uh, zero-knowledge proofs uh, for constructing malicious protocols. The main question that we are trying to address here is, what is the overhead of achieving active security given black box access to any passive OLE? Not any tailor-made, not specific implementations, assumptions, so forth. Given any passive uh, OLE implementation, what is the cost of getting active security? So the main result that we have is that we show we show a, a compilation where we use constant black box invocations of a passive OLE. Given that this is, I, I keep talking concrete efficiency, I should tell that if your circuit is nice enough, and by nice I mean if they are wide, sufficiently wide, then this overhead is actually two. Now, uh, for people who know who are familiar with like passive protocols in the space, you should just think of this as GMW. It's the passive version, and we get it twice uh, at the cost twice of uh, GMW. And this is the communication overhead that I'm talking about. The computational overhead, I'll talk, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, this is also not uh, that much uh, higher. Can I speak of Yao? You can. Speak of Yao also? Uh, no, but I'm, I, this is, uh, yeah. So Yao, I mean, I can talk about Boolean later. Uh, there has been work, but this is, primarily for arithmetic functions. So uh, just a, another, like if you instantiate, just if you cared about just getting active OLEs, if you think about just pre-processing some random OLEs and then using it the way uh, Yuval mentioned as offline and online, if you just wanted to get active OLE from passive OLE, be sure that you can do it at the rate of two black box invocations of the passive OLE protocol. And just to sort of uh, say, uh, you know, bring up the, the previous work, Dotling et al. show for the black box case, they need 22 invocations of a malicious OLE. And um, the work of Gosh et al. show again with a tailor-made OLE, they actually show you can do two. So it's not quite black box in any implementation, but they get this number two for a very specific uh, passive uh, OLE. And it also requires... Yes, so uh, Yuval is right. The 22 refers for any generic OLE, but here, I mean, the two is not quite, I mean, it's hard to put it in context. It's two invocations of this very specific uh, passive uh, OLE protocol. All right, so again, I'm going to talk about, uh, this might sound cryptic a little bit. I'll, I, if I have a few minutes at the end, I'm going to show you, we can construct an active OLE that is better than a passive uh, OLE. All right, so some techniques. So the main technique that we, we follow here is, yes. I would never say best because then most of us can go home. But uh, I think this gives sort of a generic approach of thinking about when you want to construct actively secure protocols, think of passive, see the best protocol, try to amplify it to active and, you know, this is the space where at least Yuval, uh, Karmit and I in the last uh, couple of years, we focused on improving this overhead. Uh -huh. And being generic in the, in the passive protocol helps you generalize to, to many settings. Yeah, so I know there are many dimensions, but you can just at least 
competitive, like like in. I'll give you performance. There is an implementation, so I can give you some performance uh, at the end. When you say when you talk about uh, active versus passive OLE, you're talking about the initial uh, uh, business cards exchange first phase, right? That's so, that's where the, that's where it comes. To so I, I mean, uh, it, it it has applications to the initial business, like uh, in Yuval's thing, the offline pre-processing phase requires a malicious protocol for which you can use our techniques. But in general, we're talking about, you know, take GMW, uh, you, you just need OLEs to do arithmetic functionality. If you, want to, if you want to get malicious security, we show that we can get GMW like twice the cost based on passive OLE. I don't know if I'm making sense. I see. I see. Okay. So, uh, and I also might assume that the the in some regimes even the computational efficiency of this could be better than yeah. using PCGs. Yeah, yeah. at least currently. So, on a high level, I mean, this work. Uh, I mean, if I had to sort of trivialize the work, it is about using the IPS approach, which is uh, one of the beautiful works that actually introduced this kind of you know, compiling passive or, you know, milder components to, uh, you know, um, by boosting uh, security, what we have done is sort of tighten various aspects of this compiler to get uh, an efficient uh, protocol, okay? And on a high level, I'll, I'll try to explain IPS. Uh, it's hard to explain in three slides, but whatever I can, I'll try to do it in the next three slides. On a high level, this approach by uh, Ishai Prabhakaran and Sahai is to take two kinds of MPC protocols and combine them to get something of better security. The two, the two milder building blocks that we are going to use, one is active uh, multi-party computation with honest majority. This is something that we know since the 80s, BGW, CCD, like we've seen all these works that show how to get active uh, MPC with uh, honest majority. And you know, this is, as, uh, as Yuval said, you, ne you don't need any cryptography, it's non-cryptographic. And the second one is a passive uh, protocol against a uh, dishonest majority. So combining these two protocols, we're going to get active security against dishonest uh, majority. And this is the IPS approach. So let me just quickly give a pictorial, what do I mean by uh, active uh, MPC with honest majority? We're going to have this sort of client server model where you imagine that we have two clients, that have inputs, there, is a, there are a set of servers, the clients are going to distribute their inputs to the, um, uh, to the servers. The servers will do the computation and um, return the answers to the clients. In this model, we are going to assume that an adversary can corrupt at most one of the clients and at most half of the servers. So we are trying to construct protocols in this regime. All our classic uh, uh, honest majority protocols fits uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this model, okay? So this is the first component. The second component is uh, passive two-party computation against dishonest majority. Here, uh, the model is that an adversary can passively corrupt at most one of the uh, two clients. Okay, and here, as I said, I mean, for people who know this space, GMW is the classic protocol, and we are going to use the GMW protocol for uh, instantiating this. And GMW protocol for evaluating secure arithmetic functionalities essentially proceeds as, you know, you secret share your uh, inputs, and then you invoke a passive OLE uh, for every multiplication gain. This is how the GMW protocol proceeds. So we're going to take the, the IPS approach says you can take these two components, combine it to get malicious security against uh, uh, a dishonest majority, or in this case, against one client. So before I go into uh, showing this compiler, I just want to say we need uh, uh, one ingredient, which we all know, which is Shamir, uh, secret sharing, which allows you using a polynomial to store your secret at P of zero, and then be able to distribute your secret across N servers, where up to T of them cannot learn anything, and beyond that, they can 
uh, recover the secret. We're going to do a slight extension of the, the Shamir sharing, which is referred to as pack secret sharing, introduced by Franklin and Young, which says, well, why store only one secret at P of zero in the polynomial, you can store more. This affects the parameter of the, the threshold parameters of uh, privacy and uh, reconstruction, but this is sort of going to give us this amortized benefit that uh, normal uh, secret sharing uh, will not give us. Okay, so just two key properties that, you know, to understand the IPS compiler, the two key properties of the secret sharing is that knowing up to T values does not compromise privacy and, you know, changing up to, you know, the error correction threshold, if you think of this as error correcting code, will not affect correctness of uh, the computation. So what is the IPS approach? Again, this is just a one slide version of IPS approach. It says that you're going to use the honest majority protocol to implement whatever functionality you care about. But in the real world, there aren't these servers that do the computation. Instead, you're going to have these servers emulated by the two parties themselves. The state of every server is going to be in a shared, in an additively shared form between the clients. And the clients are going to emulate each of these servers. Okay? So in essence, we are emulating the outer protocol, except that you don't have the servers. You're going to use what the the passive or the inner protocol to emulate these servers. Now, the outer protocol gives you security only if there is an honest majority. To ensure that we get this property, we need to make sure that even if when these servers are emulated using a passive protocol, you somehow can enforce honest behavior on a majority of these servers. And the way you're going to do it is that each client monitors the other client on up to, let's say, T of these servers meaning how they perform in these actions. I know complete state of the server, and I will check the other person's behavior on T servers. Now, this by a, a classic cut and choose analysis, you can show that, well, if the adversary tries to cheat in many servers, the adversary will be caught. But if the adversary cheats in very few, the, the error correction uh, of uh, Shamir sharing kicks in to get correct. Roughly speaking, again, I'm trivializing a lot of things, but this is how the IPS approach uh, essentially works, okay? So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip one more ingredient that we had from a previous paper. I'll talk about it um, maybe in, a, in one sentence in another uh, slide. So this is, so uh, as I said, what we do is we take the IPS approach and we construct, uh, we, we sort of tighten the parameters and show how to uh, get uh, all this efficiency that I talked about. Let me just sort of give you a pictorial diagram of how we would get an active OLE from uh, a passive uh, OLE. Rather than talk about the general secure arithmetic computation, which does follow from the IPS approach, let me just take you this instantiation of getting active OLE from passive OLE. Okay, so imagine that we want to do many, many uh, OLEs. And again, you know, the, the, the overhead that I claim of two comes when you want to do this in a batch setting. When I want to do many OLEs at a time, then I'm going to get this two overhead. So what do you do? So let's say that, you know, you have M inputs. So they have A, I, B, I. The sender has A, I, B, I, and the, the receiver has X, I. Now, I'm just going to give you the outer protocol, but you push it through the IPS compiler, you're going to get uh, you know, the efficiency. So how does the outer protocol look? Well, each uh, Alice and Bob are going to encode their uh, inputs using pack secret sharing to get uh, the code A1 through AN, or the set of shares A1 through AN, B1 through BN, and X1 through XN. They're going to give AI, BI, XI to the server, the server is going to, each server is going to locally just compute an OLE computation. So they're going to take AI, XI, BI and compute AI, XI plus BI. And then there needs to be one check. Remember, we need this to be actively secure. Now it's not clear when the clients share their inputs, are these sharings, uh, are they correct? And for here, we need to do a small test to check that all the shares uh, are good. To do this, this is where we sort of uh, tighten the analysis. We do, uh, we introduce a new kind of test that, well, new kind of analysis, not new kind of test, which says that if I want to check a set of shares, if they are all, you know, valid Shamir shares, think of it as 
getting verifiable secret sharing in a different way. Now, you can imagine that these servers get access to some randomness, let's say through some coin tossing protocol, and you know they are going to share amongst themselves a random linear combination of these shares and check if the random linear combination is a valid set of shares, okay? And this is what the slides that I skipped show that we have an improved analysis of the soundness of this test. When we have many, many vectors that we want to all check uh, of uh, if they are you know, valid Shamir shares, we, we do this random linear combination to check it, but we give an improved soundness analysis of you know, how many do you want to, how many servers have to be watched and so forth. We give a, a better soundness analysis in this space. Not in this work, actually in a previous work, again, joint with uh, uh, Karmit and uh, Yuval. So after this is done, if you know, the random linear combination test passes through, then the servers are going to pass the CIs and from the CIs, uh, you know, Bob is going to decode and get uh, the output. This is, the, this is essentially our protocol. This is the outer protocol. You can ask what is the overhead of doing the IPS uh, approach. It's just about setting up watch lists, which is running a K out of N uh, oblivious transfer. So besides this, like this is uh, essentially our approach. Ensure, like to do every multiplication AI XI plus BI, when you emulate it using an inner protocol, will invoke one passive OLE. This is how you should think of it. So the cost of this whole protocol, the number of OLEs, the number of passive OLEs to emulate this protocol is the number of servers that you need to do. So in essence, if I want to do M OLEs, I'm going to encode it to N servers and I'm going to do this. Roughly what we care about is this ratio N divided by M. And this we show for you know, our soundness analysis. This as, you know, I, I'll give you a table we, we show that for M large enough, like close to half a million, um, this becomes two. But even for smaller values, it's not like too high. Okay, so just to, uh, I, I want to stress here that the, um, the key feature in this whole thing is that we can base our protocol like black box on any passive OLE. And the main features are that, you know, it's more flexible, you can use any, you don't need like tailor-made, you don't need LWE based or any of these things. You can use any OLE for uh, instantiating the, the passive protocol. You could even imagine maybe physical uh, implementations of a passive uh, OLE protocol. In particular, compared to previous work, you don't need this sort of zero knowledge friendliness to get um, active security. You can use any off the shelf software or hardware implementation. A second feature that uh, I, I want to talk about is um, that we can even go weaker than passive OLE. You can even imagine your OLE has some correctness error, like for HSS-based constructions that you all mentioned in the previous talk, as well as like if you, even like in some OLE implementations, the privacy can be compromised with a small uh, probability. This happens when you use LWE-based uh, uh, OLE implementation when you set the parameters more aggressively. So uh, in one slide, I sort of want to tell you this uh, thing where, we sh where I mentioned that you can get active better than uh, passive. The, the extension is with respect to these things where if you use a leaky OLE, and by a leaky OLE, I mean one that compromises privacy with some small uh, probability. So if you use like LWE-based uh, OLE, where you implement, L you implement a simple additively homomorphic encryption using LWE, you can imagine that if you set the parameters aggressively, it can happen that the receiver learns some small fraction of what A and B could be. Like a small, uh, there's a small leakage on, um, the values A and B to the receiver. Now, I want to say that you can put a leaky OLE in the IPS compiler and still get some benefits um, from the IPS approach. But the one thing that, um, so let me just sort of show you here. This is the diagram we had. And what happens if you use a leaky OLE to implement each of these servers multiplication? It, in essence, what happens is that the the adversary, let's say the receiver here, learns T full views of the servers. This is just because of the watch list. But in the rest of the servers, it could, you know, whatever my OLE leaks, it's going to leak. So it could leak some small amount of information in the rest of the servers. 
So we show how to get to, to accommodate a leaky OLE. It turns out that if we use a leakage resilient secret sharing scheme, you can get it. So the same IPS compiler works as long as I can show that this small leakage on the remaining servers does not affect you know, uh, security in any, uh, in any way. And you know, leakage resilience, there have been several works, there have been also several works um, on um, even leakage resilient uh, secret sharing. The work that, uh, given my time limit, I just want to sort of talk about the one work that's closely relevant to what we did, which is uh, the work of Benamuda et al. from uh, Crypto 2018, where they actually uh, like analyze the leakage resilience of um, in, the, in the way we want it, which they call local, local leakage resilience for both like additively uh, additive secret sharing schemes and like linear secret sharing schemes like uh, the, the Shamir secret sharing scheme. So they kind of show that, you know, when you consider things mod P for some prime P, additive sharing has some good features, but Shamir sharing, I mean, they are able to show some a uh, small kind of benefit in terms of leakage, you can leak up to log p bits per share and you can tolerate t equals like n minus square root of n. Now I should, I should say that this is not useful yet for the IPS compiler because you are going to need honest majority, t needs to be less than n by two. And I, I sort of want to point out here, this t here refers to the degree of the Shamir sharing scheme, not the watch list size. I mean, there could be a confusion here. You know, let's ignore the watch list size for now. This T refers to, you know, the degree of the code. And this is not yet enough for, you know, uh, our setting where we want to invoke this, this leakage resilience when T is um, less than N by two. So uh, actually, I should also say there's been more works. Again, I'm not listing all the works here. There has been at least in the last, I think, two months, I saw three papers on uh, ePrint that talk about uh, leakage resilience of uh, secret sharing, but none of them are relevant to our setting, uh, mostly because it's not in this, uh, in this regime. But I should point out that there is something uh, nice about our setting in that we don't need to, all these previous works that talk about leakage resilience care about leaking more than one bit of information on all these shares. But in our setting, when we think of LWE and the kind of error that comes from LWE, you can even think of leakage which is less than a bit in the sub-bit regime. And this was not sort of analyzed in the previous works. And you know, the one of the things that we do here is um, we give a new leakage lemma for the sub-bit regime. And I should say that we don't have a full proof in that, it, you know, just taking from, you know, the LW, that proves it for the LWE setting. I, let me just put the context, our leakage lemma refers to a very specific kind of leakage, which hopefully we are trying to extend it to the LWE kind of leakage. Um, our model is this exclusion set model where the adversary gets to pick a small set for each of the servers or like for each of the shares and it gets leakage whether it belongs to the set or not, okay? And I say small because this can be like fine-tuned based on how aggressive you set the parameters, the, the, the size of this exclusion set is, uh, uh, is determined by, by that factor. Anyways, long story short, for this regime, you can prove some meaningful parameters where we can get active security starting from uh, a leaky OLE and you know the current techniques that take LWE to do these things actually give worse passive OLE than what we get through active OLE and it's only in this sense that I mean that our active OLE is better than uh, passive uh, OLE and I how much time do I have I'm out of time okay I had some implementation slides which you know you can come and ask me offline this is a table which says the n by m values that we get for different values of uh, m. Uh, we measure our performance uh, compared to like the, the state of the art, like overdrive from Eurocrypt 2018. This is one of the, uh, the main works. And we have, uh, we actually show that we can, we, we compete with them in generating what are called beaver triples. But 
to invoke our protocol, we don't need Beaver triples. We can just use our whole IPS protocol to get, and that would be much like better than generating Beaver triples and, and computing the functionality. So just to conclude, we get the first concretely efficient sort of general passive to active compiler. We show how to get active OLEs to any, from any passive OLEs. We give an implementation, and then we have some nice uh, you know, connection to leakage resilience secret sharing that gives us like more better like concrete efficiency. Thanks. Uh, for two-party computation, how would it compare to just garbled circuit and cut and choose and sort of optimize techniques for that? Right. So, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, if you use, first of all, you have to convert like field arithmetic to Boolean. This is already like a, a, an overhead. But also the techniques for like passive to active. I mean, we have a work that shows you can do this with constant overhead, but that requires algebraic geometric codes and uh, so forth. But uh, if you didn't want to use that, the overhead is typically you know, security parameters. So, you know, active to passive is like 40 or whatever is your thing. So you, you don't want to do that. Like Oh yeah, yeah based on uh, the, the work of uh, Shao, uh, it's, I think it is 17 if I remember. No? About 10, okay. It's about 10 now for 40 bit security. Or the next 